I'll let you introduce yourself and your slides, sure. and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, and then, um, are we ready to go? Excellent. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Right. Well, thanks for coming out, presenting for us today, and uh, we'll let you go ahead and get started, and I'll get out of your way. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. This is a good crowd. Um, yeah, we want to talk. Um, this is uh, part of the uh, Future Shock series. Uh, typically, they have to meet four criteria. Uh, we like to be point of origin hacking, something new and exciting. We like to introduce some radical thinking. Um, and of course, Beyond Embedded, uh, which is the convergence of multiple domains. So we're familiar with the cyber physical stuff, um, but it even goes beyond that. Uh, and then, of course, tools of the trade. So uh, today, we're going to talk about the future of fraud today. So who am I? Um, I used to be the guy that said no. Now I'm the person that has to facilitate yes. So I started out as a hacker uh, way back in the Cold War. I rebranded myself as a security researcher. Uh, have had lots of jobs. Um, just got out of corporate space. Uh, had been there for over 20 years working for a large global telco. So I've seen a lot of interesting things. And I have no disclaimers. Um, because I don't care what you do. Um, but I, if, you know, to be honest, what I'm trying to do, I'm really happy to be back here. It's been 15 years or so since uh, I've been here. Uh, it's pretty awesome. I'm glad to see it's still going. And uh, we have a lot of new faces and some old faces yeah. here. We need to get you up there. I did, I did not realize uh, that I know Daryl mentioned it. It just went one and it went out the other. That's okay. The, the accolades, the fact that we that, that you still exist and that I can come back home um, is is uh, recognition enough. It's good enough for me. Um, but I really I want to be an innovator and a trusted advisor. So that's kind of my goal when I grow up. Um, so back in 2006, I wrote a um, technical paper for SANS uh, GSEC. I don't know if we have any GSECs um, in the audience. If you've never done the process, it's pretty awesome. I think I've done three or four of them now. Uh, but back then, um, was really interested in corporate identity fraud. Uh, basically, uh, websites impersonating legitimate websites. And so, uh, the, the research was essentially, you know, what type of traditional and non-traditional uh, corporate assets could be abused to commit fraud. Uh, and out of that, what I found out was that um, the only practices even the largest corporations had involved trademarks um, and brands. And most companies only know what their brand is worth when they're buying or selling something. I thought that was very interesting. And so back in the day, if uh, somebody were to see a uh, spoofed website uh, that was trying to entice people to come and click on something, uh, and, and the owner of the copyright or the custodians became aware of it, what they would do is they would take lots of pictures, they would print them out, they would put them in a FedEx envelope, and they would send them via custody to the the target, um, and this was all done with lawyers. And you can imagine, sometimes they were FedExing uh, these packages to floors above or below where they were. Um, not really a speedy response. Um, and in fact, the only litmus test to determine whether um, it was uh, something they wanted to follow up or not was, was it actionable from a legal standpoint? Could we sue them? Was there somewhere to sue? And you can imagine how that went. Um, so fast forward 15 years, um, I said, well, okay, I want to do another paper. Um, let's see what the state of the art is, because I'm sure that organizations, corporations have gotten better in 15 years, right? So I was going to want to, to assess how the practices had matured, and if, in fact, they were ready to take on the collision of the IT, uh, OT, physical, and cyber domains coming together where actually human beneficiaries could be harmed if uh, these entities don't get it right. And there's a link to the paper there, if you want to read it. So, um, I mean, spoiler alert, um, probably haven't gotten really good at it. Um, and, and it's probably maybe gotten worse. But back in 2006, uh, traditional, what I called corporate identity asset. So if you're a corporation and you have an asset, you have a fiduciary responsibility to track that asset and protect it. So that's kind of where I was going with the terminology. So we talked about trademarks and, and logos, um, domain names and email addresses. It was the domain names that were being uh, most abused. 
typo squatters, um, misspelling, things like that. But even um, kind of trying to be forward thinking, uh, SSL certificates, because if that's your root of trust and you can compromise that, that is kind of an identity asset, right? Um, all your key, key material, uh, your IP address space. Some of the biggest corporations have had these uh, class A, class B address space for a long time. And so they are kind of associated with them and they typically get put into a whitelist, correct? So it's like, oh, it's coming from this trusted partner. They're cool. Uh, what happened if you abuse that? Things like vanity numbers. One of my all-time favorite policies that I got implemented at a um, large legal f uh, uh, company uh, that's still on the books, I hope, um, was that caller ID could not be used as a form of authentication. And that was actually um, an easy fight because... Uh, we, we use spoof cards to show people how easy it was. I don't know if anybody remember spoof cards. <laughs> um, now, fast forward, where are we at? What, what kind of digital assets? Are there more or less? Oh, less. Oh, less. <laughs> uh, the, yes, there's, there's a lot more. So we actually have uh, the, the blending of two domains, your private life and your public life, uh, or your work life, your professional life, that COVID, I mean, if you thought there was ever any doubt, COVID sorted that out for us. And so people are doing uh, company work on their own devices at home. They bring their own devices to work. And all of those social media accounts, uh, and people can get um, lambasted if they're publishing things in their personal life. Uh, that don't um, align with their organizational um, um, uh, policies. Cloud conferencing platforms. How many people have identities on more than two platforms? Three, four, and that's that first five minutes of every meeting, trying to figure out why your microphone's not working. Okay. Uh, also, I had some interest, in, you know, I think crypto and blockchains or any of the open ledger stuff. If anybody's done things with smart contracts, I have a very interesting story with a Chinese company for helium, uh, Bobcat Miners, where I, I'm convinced that I never actually engaged with any humans at all. Um, so it's kind of funny because there is no escalation path. PII, um, doxed uh, or abandoned artifacts. So there, and, and even at, for old networker folks in here, um, ASNs, your BGP peerings, those are, and, and they're, I wouldn't be surprised if people don't know what they are, but that is how every bit of traffic gets routed anywhere in the world. And if you co-op one of those trust relationships, all of a sudden you can start routing your traffic your traffic gets routed through um, geographies that maybe you don't approve of. Um, you can often wonder what the motivation is for certain undersea cables getting cut. Is it to deny the uh, adversary of the capability or is it to reroute their traffic? So if we're going to um, try to adopt a new definition for digital identity fraud, basically it's the abuse of these digital assets through the, the assets that I'm mentioning, or any asset actually, but that's perpetrated through some electromagnetic magnetic communication medium. So it's got to have the cyber piece in there to, to fall under digital as far as I'm concerned. And the intent is like most fraud to divert, deceive, um, or defraud our identity stakeholders. Now, transformational trends, uh, you'll notice I, I only have one reference to AI in here because that's the new drinking game, and I am not drinking this morning. But uh, in the transformational trends, mobility, cheaper, faster, uh, everything, all the Internet of Dangerous Things are going to have backup, and they're going to have sims in there. Uh, the, the transformational trends in compute, quantum, certainly, but AI, machine learning, being readily available to people uh, to do good things and potentially bad things. And then uh, what we see in anti-social media uh, or social media, there's so many of them, right? And it's so splintering, but it's also um, uh, could be great for bringing people together with like interests. It could also be used to divide people. So all of these things that could be used for good things can be used for bad things. And I think hackers, you know, we know that and we've exploited that and enjoyed um, understanding how it works. So I'm not going to give a bunch of doom and gloom. What I'm suggesting here is that this is a really good time, especially if people are migrating to the cloud. Ding, another buzz, buzzword. Uh, or to other people's data centers, that if they do it right, that transformational bit, if you do it right, 
you can you can change the game. You could become a hard target. So these wicked problems, the the, the sheer number of assets. Um, if you can't manage your assets, um, anybody know what a CMDB is? Okay. Uh, anybody doing anything in manufacturing? And you go into a plant environment and say, let me see your asset list, your CMDB. You know, it might be, well, which one? Um, people don't know how many things are in their environment, how many chairs. That problem is not going to get any simpler. And if you look at almost everybody in our industry, they're really just trying to figure out to give you visibility to those things that you should be managing. Well, I would tell you visibility without control is liability, but that's a whole nother discussion. Now, what I'm also looking for is these hidden dependencies. In hindsight, the one you don't see the one that gets you. In hindsight, it's like, oh, we should have seen that, right? That's a problem. So you have too many things interacting in too many different ways, creating blind spots. We have the asymmetric nature of cyber, right? If I have all this stuff, I have to protect it to be an effective bad guy. I only have to win once. Um, and those domains that are collide, colliding, cyber physical, social political, you start overlapping them, more opportunity for blind spots. And they're three-dimensional blind spots, if that makes sense. The unique opportunity, though, is if you can adopt at least for the digital assets, the things that matter, the things that get people pwned, the things that your stakeholders in the business can get behind, you have a chance. Um, I'm not going to sit here and try to sell you something new. Uh, the basics and hygiene are really where, where I like to, to focus. But you probably, in your environments, uh, especially if you're in large corporations or government, you probably have enough tech. You probably have a lot of capabilities that you're not using effectively, what I'll call latent capabilities. So always look to what you already have, because it's an easier business case to get more value out of something you already have than buying something else. And if you do have to buy something else, make sure two things go out the other door, because somebody has to operate it once you <laughs> after the sale is done, right? And just protect what matters most. And if, if your organization doesn't know what matters most, game over. You'll never be successful in any of these things that I'm talking about. So threat catalogs. Everybody knows what a threat catalog is? It's essentially a list of all the bad stuff that can happen to you. Um, threat catalogs uh, can have crazy things like a meteor might come shooting out of the sky and kill us. Is that relevant? Well, no, if we're all dead, it probably doesn't matter. But you could certainly have that in there. It just put it as a lower priority. Typically, the things that find their way to the top of a board's risk register threat catalog um, are things that they've read about something that's happened to the competition, or you may have had a compelling event in your own environment, and I guarantee you, um, you'll remember that one. And, and never, you should always learn those lessons, just like you said. If somebody gets popped, we'll do the post-mortem. We'll print you up some free Kevin stickers. But when you come out, we'll le hopefully learn from your mistakes. The threat catalogs, that the ones, this is kind of a sample one I'm doing for manufacturing right now, but extortion, which is the one that we hear most about all the time. Uh, Multi-domain DDoS, this one's kind of interesting because a lot of people um, who moved to the cloud said, oh, okay, we're getting off MPLS, which is a private network, to public internet. That's really cool. We're going to save a bunch of money. We're going to use somebody else's stuff. Those people who did not invest in anti-DDoS protection probably missed it. Uh, missed it because they have no SLA anymore, and they're easily victims for extortion. But multi-domain DDoS, for those companies that actually have it, those protections, ask yourself this, how long could I survive? How much scrubbing capacity do I have in region? What happens if they hit me high and hit me low at the same time, or hit me on multiple fronts? Most organizations will not uh, will succumb uh, to these types of if you become somebody's target. So uh, anybody that says they have a domain denial of service protection, you should question that. And I'm a big proponent. It'll come back to it over and over in the session. Modeling, assessment, and simulation. So test it. Uh, very few organizations actually have robust DR or BCP planning. They might do some tabletops. Nobody's actually really trying to take out a site with a simulation, and you should do that. Um, and there are people who are really good at it. Uh, they're called the adversaries, um, and then there are some people who are good at it, uh, which can help you um, from a company standpoint. Uh, but they're not widely known, and they're not making a bunch of money on this, so um, it's more of a passion um, than a, an actual uh, uh, business. Nationalization of assets. This is really if you operate in a country. 
uh, where they have eminent domain. America is one of those. We need manufacturing cap cap capacities, so we're going to take over your factory. Um, we actually had uh, had an engagement with a company that was making uh, very nice masks, and they were being asked to make masks for the countries they were operating in. And their concern wasn't the loss of manufacturing capacity, which is a legitimate business concern. Uh, their real issue was with the secret sauce. So you know, everybody knows that the the secret to Coca Cola's. It's not the secret recipe. You could reverse engineer that. It's how do they make a consistent product the same way everywhere and be profitable. Those are the manufacturing processes. And those are actually embedded in the machines in the plants. So if you could steal that, then you could make those masks or that soda or anything anywhere in the world. And then, of course, maybe there's people out there that want to mess with the market or consumer uh, confidence or voter manipulation. So the curious case of Mr. Pink, um, just relate the story the first time I ever got engaged uh, with a ransomware. Coming back from Texas, um, get off plane mode, mailbox is blowing up, operations guy, what's up? Hey man, we have a problem, we have a problem, okay, you know, calm down, everything will be okay, take a breath. It turns out that uh, our client had received a um, extortion message. It said, basically, Monday morning, we're going to take out your website, and if you don't pay us this amount of money, um, game over. And they were, everybody was freaking out. And it was getting passed back and forth. The message was actually two days old because it had not gotten to the right person, which sometimes is an issue when you're extorting people. You want to get to the people that actually could do something. So it bounced about around the organization. So I'm looking at it. So the first thing, we convene a little bit of a um, war room and we get a conference call together. And it's like, OK, what is your policy on extortion? Exactly the same thing. We have one. Crickets. <laughs> All right, so we have no policy, so we have no guidance, so I'm going to have to make a consult and give you my advice, and maybe it's the right advice, maybe it's the wrong advice, but we'll hopefully base it on facts. I said, okay, there's two ways. You don't pay or you pay. That is one policy, and if they would have had it written down, it might have made this whole exercise. Well, I wouldn't have my story, so... <laughs> So, so we're having that conversation. I said, okay, well, how many Bitcoins do you have? What's a Bitcoin? <laughs> okay. All right. So let's, let's, let's assume this is going to happen. And let's, um, you don't have Bitcoins. There's probably no way we can do it. I can't advise you to, to go use Bitcoin because we don't know who the adversary is. Let's prepare for the attack. And let's not do something. Now, when we're analyzing the artifacts, there were a lot of indicators of what I call indicators of BS, the misspellings in the, in the email, the fact that they didn't get to the right person, the fact that they were extorting a very large company and at that time only asking for five bitcoins, which was about 500, about maybe $1,000, somewhere between two and $5,000. So this, if they were really going to do what they said they were going to do to this particular target, they should have been asking for a lot more than that. So my assessment was, it's BS. They're not going to do, and if they're going to do it, they're ankle biters. But we should prepare. We should prepare as if it's actually going to happen. Well, this is this wasn't a trend, so we didn't have a lot of things to look at. Uh, the, the, so the the question was, uh, isn't it a technique for, I'll say, criminals? I don't equate hackers and criminals. So isn't is it criminals using hacking techniques to actually start the attack? Um, this is more sophisticated because you you also need things like proof of life. But in this particular story, which I'm going to wrap up real quick here. Um, we made the decision not to pay. Uh, Mr. Pink, don't tip. You don't feed the pigeons. They always come back. And we prepared uh, to, for the worst. Monday came and went. Nothing happened. Okay. It was a spam kind of uh, solicitation. They misspelled everything. Um, they were extorting for not enough money. So it was a pretty safe bet. But what we did was we went on high alert and we did a post-mortem. And now they have a policy on extortion, they have work instructions on who to bring in there, and they have to bring the, own, the custodians of the brands, 
Because it's the brand, believe it or not, IT people, CISOs, no, no, no. It's the lawyers and the brand owners that actually dictate what you're going to do. And in some cases, I, I, I do not agree with pain uh, extortion. Uh, and, and the observations and the things you guys were talking about earlier, back then, it was spam. Cast your net wide. If somebody clicks, so it's just like Nigerian prince scams. Uh, basic tactics, uh, meaning the story could apply. They didn't even tell us which, which website. And this, these, this company had tens of thousands of websites and many brands. So it's easily spotted. The perfect crime, I don't know. Um, I don't know how many uh, spam messages, a million to get one or two hits, um, but I don't know how well it was doing, so that's questionable. Now, today, highly targeted, very sophisticated, what I call G-commerce, automation. They outsource it. There is an ecosystem where people will be the first level call centers. They'll qualify the targets. I just came off of a case where a lady, you mentioned the, the, the virtual kidnapping, um, I mean, sorry, the, the, the extortion, um, leveraging somebody you love. You call on a spoof number. It looks like it's coming from the grandson's cell phone. Hey, I'm in jail. Can you bail me out? The only way to do that, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this particular one was really sophisticated in its story was so crazy that the government was um, going to, that her, her grandchild was working with somebody was under government protection and that they were going to try to do a scam against her bank account and the only way to protect her bank account was to move all that money to Bitcoin and so they transferred her to the help desk and this lady who had to go from New York City on a bus to Connecticut where they have a Bitcoin ATM they stayed with her on that call on that on that trip and walked her through doing two transactions at the ATM on a cell phone. So probably the patience, patience of Job, but the point is that is a sophisticated operation and that is only one piece. That was the help desk piece. Uh, the demands are exceeding millions of dollars and in fact uh, we're seeing an increase in it, but also during the pandemic, no fuel for you. No meat for you. They were hitting critical infrastructure that had a known economic impact. And if you look at what people are willing to lose, if you're, if you're an insurance broker, because that's where all this lives now. Has anybody ever had to make a claim for cyber insurance? I, I probably don't want to raise your hands. I get that. Um, how about this? How many people have cyber insurance? If you have any insurance, I bet you have a rider. The reason I bet that is because several years ago when I was speaking uh, at RSA, a couple of uh, insurance folks uh, stopped by and we were talking and they said, hey, how do you build your actuary tables? And they looked at each other and started laughing. We don't have actuary tables. We basically have given everybody $1 million of cyber protection and whoever makes a claim against that policy, that's how we build our tables. <laughs> Guess what? Uh, there are people now who've made claims and they cannot get cyber insurance again. So that whole industry is going to change. I think Black Hat has an entire track uh, this year talking about cyber insurance. Um, but with regards to helping terrorists and things of that nature, uh, it's hard to see up here, but um, the... Um, uh, the government is basically saying there is no guarantee that if you pay, you'll get your data back or you'll get the encryption keys or that your data won't be doxed. So we can't advocate doing it, um, which is kind of a cop out. Um, pardon the pun, the FBI cops. But um, you have to have your own policy. And, you know, there's some arguments made. Hey, if people are on life support systems and I have to, um, you know, keep the oxygen going. What do I have to do? Can I unlock, um, you know, do I have to, I would pay. Well, I've got this insurance policy. The kind of the best thing about the insurance policies, once you report it, they take over. They bring their hostage negotiators in. They bring the lawyers. So they'll actually have an intermediary that will verify proof of life, that your data still exists, and that that key, they have the key, and that it will unlock it. And so super sophisticated, um, well-run uh, services. So if you're going to buy cyber insurance, make sure that you can offload all that um, because then your liabilities uh, go down. But your premiums go up. <sighs> okay, so all the different ways that people can get to people to get people to do stupid human tricks. Back in 2018, we called this CEO fraud. They pick a victim. They manipulate the victim or employees or something. 
we've got to do something now. There's always a sense of urgency, right? Something bad. Guy's going to die in jail or, you know, all these bad things that are happening. We're not going to be able to make that big merger because the wire transfer hasn't happened. Uh, so you'll see that. And back in 2018, uh, we had people saying, this is very, uh, very important. We're being targeted. And at that time, it was like a billion, um, billion euro uh, loss, um, which what would that, you know, maybe one and a half billion U.S. So it's, it's big business, but in the scheme of things, not the biggest business. And we mentioned uh, innovation um, Serious adversaries innovate. So those leading edge folks that are doing cool stuff and using hacker techniques to commit crimes, they're going to innovate. But at a certain point, others are going to imitate. And then you know you have an issue when you hit industries that automate. And I think we are in an automated industry. And when people start innovating with uh, large language models and deep fakes, um, you know, potentially game over. So the anatomy of fraud, uh, there's basically a couple components, and I'm an architecture person. I, I mean, bugs are cool, but I love architectural flaws because they can't be patched easily. Uh, and I look at things very simply. You have a sender who's the fraudster or the criminal. You have the intended recipient uh, who's the target the victim. And then there's some type of message. And we've been talking about the cyber component of that uh, and also discussing multi-domain. So I'll tell you what I mean by multi-domain. So in, in 2020, um, CEO fraud became rebranded as business email compromise. Uh, and the FBI has their uh, IC3 site, which keeps a lot of stats. So basically, people who report that they've been victimized, they report it there, FBI collects it, and they have um, tr trending information. So back in 2020, the biggest scam, the biggest money-making scam at $1.8 billion in losses uh, was coming from business email compromise. Um, and those would be things like swift wire fraud, uh, things of that nature, uh, or getting um, executives to click uh, or um, procurement offices to pay for things that they never purchased, uh, things of that nature. Uh, then romance scams. That was big. It's coming in at $600 uh, million. And then investment fraud. This would be your Nigerian prince this, you know, or lottery um, uh, games and things of that nature. So you've already won, but I can't cash the ticket. I need you to help me. And a lot of these will actually uh, entice you to do something illegal because then you're less likely to tell people about it. Um, and of course, the, the embarrassment of, of being scammed, uh, you don't tell people. And it's certainly, if it had something to do with romance, you might even be more unlikely to report this. So I'm suggesting that people, it, the perfect crime, the one maybe that's never detected, uh, where there's just a little bit of harm, uh, but I think it's underreported. Fast forward two more years, investment fraud is out there in the front at $3.3 billion. Uh, but business email compromise are still there at 2.7, so it's increased. And tech support um, scams, where you might uh, be asked to uh, pay for the antivirus to get rid of the, right, you know. With all these things where you see a loss, do you get any kind of fuel for Yeah, so the question is, uh, with these losses, do we get an idea of the amount of traffic incurred or maybe the attack surface and how much that attack surface is being targeted might be the question. We Well, that's my punchline. That's where we're going to go with the research. But I can't tell you, this suggests to me that crime does pay. <laughs> Pays well. So with our... Um, Deep fakes and antisocial behavior. So in the paper, I talk a little bit about what's next and why it's so scary. Uh, I think all of us have been experiencing the last uh, you know, two or three months learning about things and being scared about things that maybe we should have been scared about a long time. Um, but it, it, the, the bit that I'm looking at in here is really what role does morals, ethics, and regulations play? Uh, because they always catch up later. And in, in IT, we haven't had a lot of uh, moral or ethics training. I don't know of, of any conference other than Troopers where they had one speaker that actually talked about it. Um, and that's, you know, directly proportional to the safety, uh, security, and privacy or the world we might want to live in. So we can live in a dystopian society that's influenced by all the, the crazy science fiction, or maybe we can take... Um, 
uh, take the world back. I don't know. Uh, that's not what I'm here on the pulpit for. But back in the spoofing days when we only had to deal with email, caller ID, and web pages, and we still failed, um, it's probably going to be more difficult in a world where we can have real and fabricated or mixed leaked documents, uh, where we have the voice apps that will change, that only need um, a very small sample uh, to get it right. You know, the final frontier, it's, it's real-time video, a la, you know, Total Recall, uh, things of that, not Total Recall, what's the one, that uh, Running Man, right? So uh, that's almost here. And it may be here. It's probably here for certain actors already. Um, the only thing that's keeping it from us is, is probably um, cost and the, the availability of GPUs, which is pretty, pretty t tough right now. Um, and then, of course, we have to deal with algorithms that are telling us what we should like and who we should like and all that anti-social media. So the trending, well, we've seen major high-profile um, hacks on Twitter. Uh, it's very difficult being off Twitter and off Facebook to make my, my stand that I don't like their business models. I find them offensive. I'm on Mastodon, but nobody gets to see my message. So LinkedIn is the only place that I'm still at, and I don't know. So I'd be happy to have that discussion of which one, and maybe we can at least get in a local Dayton Mastodon server or something. Um, so that would be, a, we could come look at a project like that. Um, the, the All the bits, so I was my last uh, three years at BT, uh, I ran the uh, um, global advisory services for the Americas, uh, Big Patch, North and South America. But I had to go through a lot of sales training. And there's, they teach salespeople all this lizard brain stuff. So it's how, how to get people to buy stuff they don't need. or how. To, and that's, that's not just BT. That's everybody. Um, get to buy more of this. Or how do you sell a commodity item to somebody and, and make them feel good about that buy versus trying to get you down to the lowest price. And so all of those things that learn how the human brain works, the algorithms have that to the max. It's just like going to Vegas and trying to find your way out of a, of a casino. They're designed not to let you out. Um, so the, um, the big fraud places that we saw uh, grow during the pandemic, unemployment. Did anybody get their name compromised in the Ohio breaches? Yep, that's an interesting thing, and you sometimes don't even know it until it's like, hey, your unemployment benefits have run out. It's like, no, I've, I've never done unemployment. I've been paying my bills. Um, try, and you get to deal with City Hall or the BMV in those kind of uh, situations. IRS fraud, uh, huge amounts of IRS fraud. And it was exacerbated uh, by the fact that nobody was going anywhere in person or being expected to, to meet in person. So the, the, the legacy of that still exists. And then when we get AIs playing the stock market, uh, what I call um, human botnets, flash mobs, and swatting, these are all things that conspire to actually hurt human beneficiaries, right? So we can either benefit from a technology or we can be harmed by it. Um, and there seems to be more ways to get harmed uh, than ever before. So modeling digital identity fraud and testing controls. This is that whole theme around modeling assessment and simulation. I love it. I feel like we are at a really great place in our profession in that we can start to quantify, mathematically discuss the probability of your getting compromised if you don't have certain controls in place. And that's because successful adversaries are using TTPs and such. So everybody's familiar with MITRE ATT&CK DEFEND? It's not perfect, but it is the, I really think it is something that we can use to actually have conversations with, with each other. And we could look at our threat catalogs that have all those bad things that can happen. But really, the ones you care about, for the stakeholders you care about, gets distilled down. And if you start mapping how those bad things actually occur in the real world, you'll see that they only map to a few TTPs. So we've taken this infinite problem set, reduced it, reduced it again, and now we can get super effective with the limited uh, uh, investment we can make or the limited resources available if we focused on those couple things. So in fraud, what, seemed, what is the, the biggest technique? We can't help anything about the recon, right, because that happens outside our sphere of influence. The social engineering, ultimately what happens? Somebody responds to something. Stupid human tricks. You click on a link. You respond to an SMS. 
you receive a letter, certified mail. Okay, first indicator BS. Certified mail has what? You cannot just find this in your mailbox. You actually have to sign for it. So, but there's a whole generation that's never received any certified mails or never been arrested. I mean, hopefully that's why you did receive it. Never been served up by somebody. <laughs> Yeah, we have, yes. I, I, you still have the cannons out there? <laughs> the cannonballs don't. Um, and then you, you open it. It's like, I have to. No, no, this is this is good. So it's addressed to my wife. Okay. Well, she, she gives this to me. She says, well, this looks official. I hadn't seen this yet. I wouldn't waste my time. But actually, it's a good story. <laughs> Pella. That's a great corporate brand, right? Windows, some of the best ones. And it's like, well, wait a minute. I've got this is this is to somebody else. So this is to to Larry who lives down in um, Liberty Township, and no action required. But we just to let you know that Level Set will be handling all the lien rights. Lien, lien. Oh, okay. That's that's how you get people takes people's houses. So why am I getting Larry's mail? And then oh, here's a very <laughs> no, no, no. This is this one. Um, he actually has a house being built in Liberty Township. At least Google Maps shows it. And he's, a, he's an attorney, which threw me off at first because I thought they were the ones doing the, the thing here. Um, this is a couple pages of very official looking um, government uh, regulations. And then here's the reference to the job site, which is my house in uh, Centerville. And it's like, oh, I go, Joe, did you order $10,000 worth of windows? Are we doing something? And she's like, what are you talking about? And it's like, oh, OK, OK. We, this company was hired. And our stakeholder, and this is where you panic, basically had her name and our address. And they're saying, hey, if, um, if you don't pay for the windows that we sent, we'll, we're going to sue you or take your house. That's the gist of this. Well, I think the end game might not have been fraud. It might have been us to buy some windows and call these people. They, they do a tracking number. So if you ever get one of these forms, there's always a number. And that's how the call center will figure you out. And they, they, it's put in there a couple different times. So as soon as you call them to ask this friendly person, then the switchboard will automatically route you. The point for this long story was that multi-domain, it's not just going to come through the email, which you can put a, you can do a very simple thing in corporate emails um, to keep people, give them an extra three to five seconds before they click. Have you ever clicked on something and at the moment of releasing, you're like, oh. <laughs> so if you can just buy three to five seconds, deactivate the links. And it's a yes. Pain, convenience, security. So I have to hold down a shift, and then I can click. But that simple act of inserting that gets you out of your muscle memory and maybe causes you to think. The one thing that, uh, that our corporation is doing with the, the, email, the links and emails is it's going through, and we're now with Outlook in the cloud, so they've got the automated system where it does all this protection around the URL. The problem is that if you want to actually see what the URL was that you were sent behind what, what shows up in the email, it's almost impossible to see what that URL was. Yeah, so, so the comment and the observation from the audience was that um, they're now using the email in the cloud, and they've got the E5 license and all that good security goodness is being on there. But the way that humans were trained in your phishing training to spot BS was to be able to see the entire link. And now, because the links have tokens and they, they're unreadable, they're, humans can't read this stuff anymore, uh, but they obfuscate it from you so that you don't have to deal with that. So they've taken one of our human firewall capabilities, if you will, um, and chucked it out. Um, so now you're just going to have to trust Microsoft. I mean, when it's, since trusted, it's been what, 20, 30 years? When did they do um, the trusted initiative? They've actually, believe it or not, I think they've done better, but it's software and it's a numbers game. How many lines of code in Windows 11? That's your, that's your friggin' um, attack surface, right? So from a, if we're going to be quantifiably secure or understand the maths behind it, the more lines of code, the more likelihood for fail or opportunity for fail. Yeah. Uh, Linux has many faults. Microsoft only has two. Everything they do is 
<laughs> All right, I will not repeat that. Um, <laughs> But um, let's just suffice to say that um, software has issues. It's written by humans, at least for the time being. Um, and we're in not infallible. Uh, but hopefully we learn um, from our failures. Uh, the, the point being here, we have the tools. We're developing techniques. We've got a threat catalog. We've got MITRE ATT&CK DEFEND. So let's create these stories and understand it, because it's not enough to know and see the disaster happening. We have to be able to stop it. And that's where we fail a lot as professionals, because we can't speak to our stakeholders in terms that they understand. So if I'm talking to another hacker, I can talk to them, and they'll get it, hopefully, most of the time. If I'm talking to a security professional, I can say, it's against, it's against policy, this is bad. From a, from a compliance person, I could talk to them and say, hey, you know, we have to maintain compliance or we can't process credit cards or we can't put out these, you know, great human, uh, you know, people saving drugs and stuff. The marketing people and the lawyers and the financial people, because it ultimately comes risk management. And Leo Cronin taught me this. This is where I started pivoting from being the person that said no because you can't protect everything. Everything is risky. Everything's broken. Nothing works. To measured risk and reward risk optimization. And so those decisions need to be made with the best information on hand. And we want to provide our organizations that. So having an ability to talk to them in, in terms they understand or stories or building a model or simulating and letting them go through and make come to their own conclusion. I mean, you're leading them there. But this, and it's probably very hard to see, but this is the history of um, domain names, the industry itself. And so way back in 1969, there was some playing around with it, but in 1984, Orwell, dot com domain comes into existence. How many specific domains are there out there? Anybody hazard a guess? A specific domain would be XYZ dot something. No, no, you're thinking top level domains. I'm saying specific domains. How about uh, half a billion? So how many of those are made up of dot com? Not bad, more than half, 300,000. Um, if you want to know any given time, this website will tell you. Um, and th the reason I know this is because we're going to go model the attack surface. We want to go figure out how bad this is. We want to have real data so that we have a deck that we can go have a conversation with the CFO, the CSO, all those stakeholders, and make it relevant to them, whether they're super techie or just tell me how much this is going to cost. Will we stay out of the newspapers, blah, blah, blah. December of last year, the list, because that's what this site gives you, they'll sell you a list of those 300 million specific domains. Right? Last December, that list was going for $4,000. Yeah. Today, that same list is $8,000. So that suggests that these lists are valuable to somebody. Uh, not enough for me. The irony of this um, attack surface, because remember, 15, 17 years ago, I was concerned that we weren't keeping up and that we only had to deal with these, you know, uh, the main dot com, because nobody was parking anything in the other weird stuff. Commerce happened in dot com. It was a prep challenge back then. But as the new generic top level domain started to appear, you know, these are the, the vanity ones that, are, you know, some country has a really cool um, uh, two character, three character, um, all of those. And when they when they allowed them to monetize that back in 2011, somebody in, in all industries, it was the food and beverage industry, somebody who understand branding. They said, look. This new uh, generic top level domains are going to cause confusion in the market. People might not know to be able to come to our restaurants. That's what I think was their concern. But um, unbeknownst to this person, the 
this was, they were really spot on um, because it's only getting worse. Everybody knows that Google released earlier in the year eight new generic top level domains. Dot dad. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm a dad. No, these are these are legit. Dad jokes. Oh, no, not for dad. I have. I don't know what for, but I do know that moms had their their uh, generic top level domain three years before. So it's okay. Moms moms have their harder. And uh, even lawyers have theirs, right? Esquire. Esquire. Dot foo. That should be fun for people who presented and. <laughs> Yeah, well, there was nobody consulted us, but yeah, we think dot zip and um, and dot movie were probably were pretty bad. But this is what you get when you do dot uh, zip, and somebody beat us to. Oh, sorry. What percentage of people, like what percentage of lawyers, will use dot esquire? What, what percentage of doctors are going to use dot phd? As soon as somebody sees one of their peer use, peers yeah. using it, oh, they're going to want it. It is something in the neighborhood of, uh, it's not a thousand, maybe it's under a sub a thousand, I think, of, of the uh, GTLDs, the generic top level domains and the top level domains, uh, but there are more coming. Uh, and it is confusing people. Uh, and it will continue to confuse people, and the problem's getting worse. And the only thing I'm really mad about is that these guys beat me to coming up with something cool like that. Because if you click on it, it's not going to steal your information. It takes you to a page and educates you. And said, if you click this one expecting to find some cool data, you're wrong. This could have been malware. You would have been compromised. So think before you click. So good, good for them. To, oh, let me hit it. <laughs> You, be, you should probably have your own AI and start training them now. <laughs> your own AI. Yeah, your own AI. Private AIs. Uh, or you don't type anything. Uh, or we go back to hard coding. Malware, most malware isn't hard coded because it shows up, you know, unless maybe you're doing IPv6, which is a whole nother talk that people don't want to talk about. But maybe trust me, it's... That, that's right. But it's not human friendly. So again... The, the average consumer, and I would even say at this point, I'm an average consumer for most of this stuff. It, we, we can't keep up. This is not a human solvable problem. It, we created it, but you're not going to be able to discern fact from fiction or why you should trust in something. And that little lock, we know that doesn't mean anything. But the, the trust that you have in a brand that doesn't want to hurt its customers and protect it, we really need to see them step up. So, I'm almost done here, and I do want to tell you about what the next steps are, where, where my head's at. I want to get this research done. So, when I, when I said, okay, this attack surface is getting bigger, so we want to create a model that we can simulate and then put that against our organization that we're responsible for and just say, hey, here's a crazy thing. How would we fare? Here's another crazy thing. How would we see that headline? Hmm. How would we react? How would we respond? If you had a model like that, you could ask some very simple, high-level decision support questions. Turn left, turn right, buy more of this, do more of that. So it's action. So how many uh, t uh, TLDs, generic and otherwise, are out there? It's a shit ton, right? So how many subdomains exist with the term, the host name status? Well, it's, sometimes, it's something less than a shit ton. Right, um, and so why do we choose status? I just found that a lot of people, a lot of organizations, especially ones that have been building, because remember, I like hidden dependencies that lead to cascading failure, and it basically we could engineer the outcome by pulling the right Jenga or having the right butterfly flap its wings, and the whole system on systems, and that those so many blind spots that exist. To me, that's that's the new hacking realm, and that's the types of things I'm looking at. We we see these a lot. How how was it? You know what happens if a bird a, a bridge burns down, or 75 gets cut off, or you have a a, a rail derailment, or you have a trucker strike, or a pandemic, or a volcano. See, we've seen these. Can you model to those? Remember I said that the meteor coming out, that's probably not something to worry about? Shit, compute's cheap. 
If we had a model, we could run any simulation. We could have continuous modeling going on for the next crazy thing that comes out of ChatGPT's window. So pick an example, domain, and let's go out and look at uh, the, the status page. And then find out if we could actually observe anything interesting or attributes across those data sets. Um, and then would there be ways to exploit those uh, dependencies to do whatever, make the world a better place or to, you know, get rich. So um, I know this is uh, Mohammed, who's my research partner over here. He's working on the next. This is a sneak peek of some of the stuff he's working on. And I don't know. Uh, do we have? I'm going to do some Q and A. We have 15, 15 more minutes. So uh, let me tell you what the ask was. Uh, the ask was, uh, hey, let's go, let's go look at these and do some modeling and find out what's going on with status pages. And is that just the new, the newest cloud-based people who have um, want to have a status page there, or the the established companies doing it? Am I familiar with the status pages? It's kind of an uptime. And it's one of those that has become like mail.domain. It's like, oh, that's probably a mail server, right? Well, FTP, right? It doesn't have to be. It can say FTP and not be FTP, right? Um, and it can say status and not be status. But I was really interested, and it seemed like a good problem set, a, a solvable uh, problem set that we could get data for. So Mo's working on something. It's a future shock series called Supply Chain Smoking. And the idea here is that we could somehow uh, do a fault injection or um, uh, deny uh, an adversary of a dependency that they have that could then lead to cascading failures. Did any Mariah Botnet, is anybody impacted by that? Did you guys lose your Twitter feeds? Did you watch your Netflix go offline? <laughs> so, so I mean, but it, but the, I had I, it's like Dyn DNS. I didn't know the Dyn DNS was with those guys, and so we became collateral damage from a dependency, and so we couldn't tweet and we couldn't watch Netflix for a while. We were not the intended target. So even if you don't feel like you have a target, this is a good exercise to understand it, and we're trying to come up with a way to do it, uh, do it mathematically, do it consistently, so that we can keep supply, ch supply chains from getting smoked. And Mo, I don't know if you, you want to come up or you want to, if you can hear, hear him uh, down there, why don't you come up? I'll give you. So uh, I basically came to this guy and said, hey, I need your help. Um, go do this, uh, handle it, and then come back. Easy peasy, right? Yeah, but I didn't have a budget, so I had to find a free resource for my... At that time, it was only 4000 but I didn't. Need, I, I, he doesn't have any budgets. Yeah, well, what was that list uh, for the TLDs? For, yeah, for uh, $8,000 today. Yeah, exactly. So you're talking chasing a lot more down. Right, so we, we but we're hackers, right? So we're not gonna pay we're not gonna pay anything for data. It wants to be free. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You could buy the lists, you can create your own lists. But that's just the deal. I'm talking about the, the subdomains. Oh yeah. Well he's gonna tell you. What so how do we how did we do that, Mo? How are you gonna do it? And what have you done so far? Well, you can take a look at their status pages, or you can look at, at their certificates. They have. Um, so from this website, uh, I was able to get a, a top 1 million uh, top level domains, and I ran them through a script to see how many of them have status pages, which was around like 10% of the top 1 million. And through and they do this for, they do this for free. So they're community folks. So they, we got the top million list. Just run, it runs out. Well, what do you think all those things that knock it on your doors all day? It, everybody's running scripts to collect all sorts of information all the time. And they keep it updated uh, weekly. So you get a weekly update for the top 1 million. And I used um, a tool called Fluff uh, to check on how many of those top um, 1 million domains had a status page, which was around 10%. And this is what you would expect to see. This would be very nice, yeah, rack space, right? Yeah, little green check marks, and those are their subdomains um, that those that top domain has. And why would you have a status page? Well, the implication is someone has a dependency on it, 
someone's using your site to do something and actually have a story about that. Um, last month I was taking a certification exam and they were down for a whole day. Well, that certification exam is a subscription base and those students have limited time uh, in their day to be able to study for that uh, certification. And if, if your site is down, then you're owing people credits. So, and, and, and in a corporate setting, we have what? SLAs. And in a home setting, when, you're, when your uh, internet goes down, you want to know. So they, they're, and some, some providers make it very easy to understand, and some people make you jump through because they don't want to expose their outage uh, or that they potentially have failed their SLA. So we would say this is the gold standard. You have somebody who's very transparent, who obviously has people that depend on their services being up there. Um, it's a, it's a maintained, well-maintained site. So we would give these guys a gold star uh, for maintaining a proper status page, at least on the surface. Yeah, and they have like, I've seen two different ways people do it. They do the check marks, the one you see on the left, and then they have more of a blog format on the right. Um, both are valid ways, and then you can have what um, Signal does. Yep. <laughs> Sweet. We're up. <laughs> and then you have some strange uh, redirects I found. Um, <laughs> This looks like to be one of their staff's portals um, for information on Walmart sites. So that's the final place. If it can't resolve anything, you end up here, which is interesting. That suggests poor hygiene, maybe, or orphaned assets. The redirects to random users. Um, maybe some resources. Or maybe a honeypot, who knows? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. But, but uh, Mo's going to continue this. We actually uh, met yesterday to talk about the next level, and it will be next level. And if you guys will have us, uh, we, we maybe bring we can share it with you uh, at one of the upcoming meetings. I'm happy to have you back. Either monthly or next year. Brilliant. Well, thanks for that. So, um, all right. So I said, not doom and gloom. What's a reasonable response? Um, we we got to change the game. You know, I think we've, we used to be tried to protect, and then there was this whole thing after the RSA breaches. It's like, oh, we just got to prepare to get pwned because there's nothing we can do about it. And we bought into that crap, and we bought into that crap that uh, uh, APTs, you know, that these state sponsors, and that's great if you're a, a security provider to blame a nation state because you can't prove it, right? Um, let's just say you have adversaries that uh, ha are skilled and they want to hurt you. You also need to become a hard target. You can't save everything, right? So have a global asset re registry. Um, even if you're home, go and do a simple uh, task. I'll challenge everybody. Go write down all the accounts you have. I have a Facebook account, I mean, a MySpace account still. Right. And I went through there and like three pages later, I was like, do I even need this stuff? Because that's your attack surface. And if you did the, the thing that we used to do, a poor person single sign on where you synchronize all your passwords. Don't do that because we all I, 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 I would be I would take a bet that everybody's had some data in a breach. And it, there, you know, when we were going to school, they used to, they'll go in your permanent record. Well, there wasn't a permanent record. There is now. It's the deep web, dark web, and your data is being sold over and over again, being monetized. Do you feel the same way about password um, I met a gentleman a couple weeks ago um, that is really making me think twice about using password managers. So I don't use password managers in the cloud. And of course, they would be. They're the ultimate target. Yeah. Why do you rob banks? <laughs> That's where the money's at, right? You, you, you certainly can. Um, a lot of people use browsers. That's also a bad practice. Um, Redline that's out there right now, all it does is, is steal that stuff. And um, so, you know, I'm going back to long ass passwords on post it notes. And how ironic is that? Because. <laughs> You know, this next generation of cyber criminals calling themselves hackers or use they're lazy. They don't do any of their own wet work. So they're not going through your garbage. They're not coming to your house. They want to stay out of the reach of, you know, and they want it to scale. And one on one, you know, um, hacker feuds and things like that, or that's uh, that's still a deep. So, yeah, writing them down, changing them frequently. 
Dumpster, well, so you, you know, the dumpster diving in this town was really good um, when Hamvention was still at Hera yeah. because nobody wanted to take anything back, and it, there was just so much stuff out there. Um, but you have it, have an asset list. You, you can't protect it if you don't value it and if you don't manage it. And so if, if you're in, in a large corporation or any uh, organization that has assets that is not really good at it, then you, you, we need to kind of say, hey, you know, you're creating new assets every day, whether you understand it or not. And those are in the cyber realm. So, um, you know, we got to solve that problem. Try to have this holistic uh, concept, meaning this is not an IT problem. It's an organization problem. It's a humanity problem. So if you're the only people in the room, you know, shaking your fist, that you, you've got to bring others into the tent. And those stakeholders, the way you get them interested, unfortunately, I'm not about fear, uncertainty, and doubt, because it's very real. You need to speak to them in a way that they'll understand how this impacts them. Why should they care? Um, and then operationalize it. Um, never waste a good, compelling event. Make sure you document it. Understand what that root cause was and ask yourself, could that happen again? Or has it already happened again? When you're looking at dwell time for adversaries living in, I think it's still like in the 200s. You know, that's almost a year that somebody's still in the environment that, you know, um, they're chess versus checkers. And then the, the most simple one uh, that I try to do whenever I'm engineering new systems and have that unique greenfield opportunity, I try to remove all discretion. Humans um, are really the only thing that should have discretion. So if you remove that, then you can automate almost everything. You can make it really easy to do the right thing and really hard to do the wrong thing. And don't panic. It's inevitable. So plan accordingly. Thank you for that.